wanted to introduce you know somebody you guys all know, Andre Iguodala, uh, who is an NBA champion. Uh, how many times over? Four. Four times over, NBA champion, as well as uh, 2015. What year is the MVP? 15. 2015 NBA MVP. So, uh, so you guys give a hand to Andre. Appreciate it, fellas. And obviously, we all, we all know how good of a player he is, right? And you guys are all athletes, so you guys share that in common. But for me, it was more important to bring somebody here that, you know, had transcended just the sports part of it, right? Obviously, the basketball part is cool and it's important. Uh, you guys are also at the top of your games and the sports you play. But for me, it was what Andre uh, and, his, and his partner, who, you know, some of you guys have met in the back who never wants to be recognized, Mr. Rudy Klein-Thomas, who's back there. Uh, uh, their, their company, Mastery, just bought about 50, for those that don't know, bought about 51% of athletes first. So we are the first and I would say only uh, African major African-American, uh, majority African-American-owned sports uh, agency in the industry right now. So that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, big deal. Before we kind of get into why we brought him here, um, there's, a, there's an argument that a lot of guys always have, and, and, and I'm sure in football locker rooms, not that I spend a lot of time there, but I spend a lot of time with these guys, about um, being able to beat the sixth man. Right? You know, you, you see the guy, what's the ball headed guy on the Lakers? He's played for the Lakers, ball headed guy, the sixth man. He's not there anymore. The white guy, what's his name? What's his name? Oh, Caruso. Caruso. Yeah, Caruso. Caruso. I'm Caruso. sure eighty percent of the guys in here think they're Caruso. better than Caruso, right? And I've had that conversation. <laughs> can you please kind of put rest of that argument that guys feel like they can play? No. Yes, no. yes. No. Think they can beat beat the worst guy on the bench. Maybe not even the, the sixth man, but the, the twelfth man on the bench. I don't know. I think they know. No. Because it's like I, I play football mm -hmm. in middle school, and it's a lot of guys. That, we saw Draymond at Michigan State. Wow. Like, that would be you guys in basketball, though, is what he's saying. Okay. Like, I couldn't get on the football field. Oh, y'all humble now today. Yeah, we I humble. Get on the football we humble. Okay. Uh, okay. Draymond actually played. Okay. Draymond, Draymond played in uh, high school. This Draymond, could, he could play. Okay. But it's just different. It's just different. It's different. It's a different, it's different. level. It might be one or two guys that can, that can uh, cross over, but yeah. Are you a football is fan? Is Micah here? Mike is not here right he's not now. He's not here. No. He swear down. He can. He's, he's sitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Michael thinks he could have went pro and everything. Um, so, again, wanted to bring him here. So, he's, you know, Andre, you've done a phenomenal job kind of, you know, with what you've done outside of the game of basketball. So, I wanted you guys to kind of talk to these guys about, for you, you know, what kind of led you into, like, okay, obviously I've done what I need to do on the basketball court. Mm -hmm. You know, I've won championships. I've been an MVP. You know, you've, you've run that gambit. You know, what made you kind of sit back and say, you know what, man, I want to do more. I want to be more. Uh, you know, was, was there a moment, you know, in your career where that kind of happened? Yeah, I was always like a curious kid, like even when I was younger. Um, like I just like competition any way possible. Like I competed with kids in my class on who got the highest grade in like math, like just weird stuff. Looking back, like my mom would always say, like I always did that. And uh, I'll never forget, I had a teacher in the eighth grade who didn't know me. He never, he wasn't even my teacher. Like he was just a, a teacher at the school, but he knew I was good at basketball, but he had no idea on like my academic background. And he told me I was gonna be a loser. And um, from that moment on, like that stuck with me. Like I'll, ne I'll never forget that. And I mean, Mr. Taylor was his name. I'm, I'm wondering where he's at. I'm gonna find him one day. But it was always like, um, I grew up in two worlds. And so I grew up like right by the projects. Like the projects was right there at that chair. Like it was in my backyard. Um, so I went to school with them every day, Boys and Girls Club. I was with the project kids every day. Like they didn't, there was no difference between me and them until I got to school. But when I went to school, I was in class with all white kids because I was like in the, the higher track classes. And so it was interesting my whole life because when I would get to school and be with the white kids in class, my friends, they found out like, oh, he a nerd. Like I was a lame for being smart. But then it was crazy because the white kids would be like, how you know all these black kids? But you in class with us. So I grew up just kind of intertwining them two different worlds. And I think it just I, it went with me. Where I'm from, nobody goes pro. We had one NBA player, but we should have had like 10. Like we had a lot of talent, but most guys don't even get past the first semester of college. And so for me, I wanted to go as far away from, as possible from home. I didn't even know I was going to the NBA. I didn't know how good I was, but I just knew I needed to go as far away from home as possible. And as and long as I got my degree, didn't come back home, I'd be fine. And then it just, you know, basketball clicked and I made it to the league. But then once I got to the league, you hear all the horror stories of 
don't go broke. That's all y'all hear, don't go broke, don't go broke. But they actually don't give you, they're getting, we're getting smarter now, so now we got the tools and we have the network, we're getting everything we need to start investing and start doing smarter things with our money now. But when I came in the league, as you all know, you do what you see. And so when I came in the league, it was like the end of the bling era, like towards the end of it, but guys still had like, it was, it was the cool thing was to have six cars the same color. It was like, yeah, like that was the, when I got in the league, like you had six white cars, six black cars, six green cars. It was like, but what, what was good for me, like I didn't know I was going to the league. Like most cats know in eighth grade they're going to the league. So, you know, they spend the money before they get to the league, taking loans from, from agents and the whole gambit. But for me, the thing that helped me was that I didn't know where to access these things. Um, but what I did know was to follow the guy who had been around a lot, the longest. And so I got to the Sixers. Obviously, everyone knows Allen Iverson, and um, who's like, I looked up to him. But I didn't think I would be Allen Iverson. And I knew like he was different on a talent level than anyone else. But when I saw Aaron McKee, I saw Kevin Ollie, and I'm faster than them, I jump higher than them. You know, I do pretty much everything just as good as them but they had been in the league for 10 years. I'm like, oh, I just, I want to be like them. They've been around for 10 years and like, I got everything they got if, and better. I, I want to be them. And so I just start following them. Like I was watching what kind of clothes they wore. Um, I asked them who their financial advisors were. One of them, I hired their financial advisor. Like I was just trying to be like them because they had been around for the longest. And I, I don't know what it was, but that's just where my mind gravitated to. And I wanted to be more than just a basketball player based upon how people perceive us. So when we walk down the street, you're just a tall basketball player, so, or you're, you're a football player, so you already know what type of energy they're giving you. You only got what you got because you play a sport. You dumb, you don't have no sense. You know what I mean? So going back to that teacher, like you're never gonna be nothing. I was like, he, no, no white person's ever gonna look at me like I'm just an athlete. And I think that just stuck with me the whole way. Got you, got you. So for you, I know, Obviously, you're a partner of Mastery. Mm -hmm. um, what made you decide, okay, you know, the tech, tech is the industry that I want to get into. Obviously, you can invest in real estate, mm -hmm. obviously the marketplace, whatever it is, right? What made you decide, you know what, I want to go down this tech lane? Because there's not a lot of people that look like us right. that are in the, tech, mm -hmm. in the tech world, right? So what made mm -hmm. you decide, like, you know, that's where I want to be? So quick story, <clears throat> we go back to like 2007. It's like my third year in the league. I have a teammate from Providence come in. He's a rookie. And... Um, I had really good vets, so I was just following that path. Like Aaron McKee and Kevin Ollie looked out for me any way they could. So I just trying to do the same thing. So I had a rookie, uh, good kid, knucklehead, and I was always on him about working hard, being early, whatever. And he would always say, you sound like Rudy. I'm like, who is Rudy? And uh, long and behold, it was Rudy, and we ended up meeting through him, and we just got this bond. Like, and he started asking me questions. Like, you're a smart cat. Like, why does your wealth management team charge you what they charge you? Like, what do they do? And I don't know, because we meet once a year, show me what I saved, show me how much money in the account. They give me a bunch of numbers I don't understand. And I just say, all right, cool, it look good to me. I don't know what a financial advisor looks like. We didn't grow up seeing financial advisors. So how we know a real from the fake? And so what Rudy did was tell me, go find out what exactly they do and go find out how much they make, if they make you money or if they lose you money. And so did all that. That's why you see the Charles Schwab commercial. And they were saying, how you, why you pay you 1% and they lost you, you down 5% of your portfolio. So regardless of what, how much money they got of yours, if they earn or lose, they still get the same percentage. And that's when the light bulb went off. And so Rudy was like, well, how about we do this? Let's open an E-Trade account. Just take a little bit of money. I think we took like 500,000, put an E-Trade account. And he was like, I'll help you. And he was like, pick two stocks. Then I'll pick some stocks. But here was the interesting part because you'll hear a lot of stories about people you know, stealing money from you, whatever, whatever. Rudy said, he's gonna tear his fee on how much money we make off this E-Trade account. So if he makes me 0% to like 8%, he don't get paid. If he made me from like 9% to like 18%, he got a certain amount. If he made me 20 to 40%, he got a certain amount. So like, the only way he really made money is if you made we money. made some money. Yeah. And then if I lost money, he would pay me all my money back. That's a good deal. So I can't lose, right? It's a good deal. And we signed a contract and everything, right? 
But, <coughs> but the, the interesting part was... <laughs> and now you got some clients. I want my cut. <laughs> no, but for real, like, he, he said, um, we wrote the contract, but he really held me accountable on what I was investing. So I wasn't like I was just two months go by and I look at the account like every single day he was like watch it and then understand why the stock goes up why the stock goes down the first two stocks I picked was Nike because I was an athlete and I've been following that my You're whole familiar life with it. Yeah. familiar with it and the other one was Apple because I was really into like the iPod like that was like the first tech um device I ever seen that I was like just blew my mind you're aging yourself right yeah, yeah, yeah I'm aging yeah, myself right 2001 was the first iPad I know Sean May had one his dad played in the league. Okay. I can go back. But I just like, these are the things that I'm interested in. And so, um, and then he had stocks that he was looking at that he was adding. So every day when he would buy a stock, I was seeing it. And then when he would sell a stock, I was seeing it. And then I started clicking other buttons, learning like, you can go deeper into a stock. Like, when, when did they have their, um, when they had the quarterly earning calls, um, you know, the CEO, the CFO usually speaks on the earning calls and tells you what they project, whether they missed it or they exceeded the expectations, the whole gambit. Then you start learning about uh, competition. And just so guys understand, when they have those, those you know, talks or whatever about what they're expecting, that kind of moves the market as well, right? Right, right. So your earning calls tells you where the market's going to go or how that stock's going to go. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you project it to be at $1 billion and you hit $989 million, like you short, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like you short 11, you short uh, whatever, 11 million, whatever. And your stock price is normally going to go down where you don't meet expectations, you know. And then I know this, this is an interesting story about Apple when they first started doing uh, iPhones. They was like, uh, we project we're selling 1 million iPhones. Then they come back, oh, we sold 3 million. Then the iPhone 2 came out. It was like, oh, we only projected we're going to sell 2 million. Then they sold 4 million. The next, they kept doing this where they was gaming the system. But then slowly but surely the market started catching up to him like, wait, y'all going to say y'all going to sell five, which I really going to sell 10. And so the market start putting 10 in as the expectation. And so now you seeing how the market can start reacting regardless of what the company's saying. So all these things I'm learning in real time because we got this account. Um, but long story short, to wrap it up, what happened was we noticed that um, Buddy went like two, three X on the account. Like we turned like 500,000 to like 1.5 million. It was crazy, right? And uh, tech stocks was where we made most of the money. And so during this time, I didn't even notice he was going out to the Bay, because this is when I was in Philly. He was going out to the Bay. And then I think um, a cat from Philly who was a venture capitalist um, who invested in tech companies, Rudy start following him, meeting up with him, learning the business. Because what we learned was we in the public stock market. But these companies have been around for so long, but we only get access when it becomes public. But there's a whole private sector, a word I never even heard of. And so when I start seeing the private sector, now you're seeing the apps come on the iPhone. All these companies building themselves on top of Apple, but they start off as startup companies and you can invest in them when the stock is worth two cents. But by the time we see it, it's worth 50 bucks. But all that growth, where did that, like the people who invested in them early, they the ones really making all the money. Like you, you can get, what's the average? Six, seven percent on the stock market over time is like you eating, like you good. But these dudes is a thousand exit on this because they invested from the beginning because all the companies are being built out in California and Silicon Valley. And so he went out there, did his homework, and that's when we were like, yo, there's a whole new world no none of us know about because they never gave us these opportunities. It's called Billionaire Boys Clubs for a reason. And it's funny is when we first went out there to start talking to them, they was like, nah, we cool. We cool. So then I go out to the Bay, sign with the Warriors, and a part of me going to the Warriors because it was like, it's perfect timing. The team was on the up and up with Steph, and I've been trying to get out here with this tech stuff for the longest because don't nobody know about it. So we co email like every VC that we had, you know, read about, you know, all the top venture capital firms. We, Can you kind of explain what venture capital is to guys? So venture capital is like, it's like Russian roulette. I mean, not Russian roulette. It's like roulette. It's the roulette yeah. table. That's really what it is. To keep it a buck, <coughs> like that roulette table, how many numbers were on the roulette table? 
right? 36, that's, right? And that's, that's not good that you know that. That's not good. I knew somebody's gonna mess up, right? It's like your boss asks you how many rounds of golf you played. It's a trick question, right? So like it's 36 on the roulette table. And so if I put 25,000 in the 36 different companies, I really only need three of them to hit, right? And then when you break it up, it's like, it's like the Hall of Fame in baseball. You bat 300, you go into the Hall of Fame. It's the same thing in tech, you know? Mm. 30%, 33% of the company is going to go under. Like, they just ain't going to work. Like, boom. 33% of the company is going, they hang around, they get bought out, mergers and acquisitions, but yeah, you, you're not going to make no money, right? You just keep your same, like, you, 0%, but you don't lose. But then the other 30%, a couple going to make you 2x, 3x, you make 50% here or there, but then you're going to have one or two companies, 80x. And that and, makes and up it, everything it makes else. up for everything yeah. else. And yeah. you still eat. Mm -hmm. You still like you're going crazy. And so what you learn about these companies is that the, on the VC firms, they just throwing their bets out there. But they see in the best companies, you know, like, they're like banks. And they got the top analysts from the top universities vetting different companies in different sectors. They know everything about them. They know what they can disrupt. They know what they got to do to disrupt them. Um, they know how to pair up with other companies to keep the, the value of the company. Uh, going up and they know how to scale companies like they're just experts at building companies and what happens is when we're not we're out of that mode now but it's an excess of money and so companies that have they only raising one million but they got like three million at their disposal especially those serial entrepreneurs like you got some folks who just keep building companies over and over Elon Musk got like he's the CEO of like four companies right now right he's been doing this for like 30 years just don't nobody know he started with PayPal took all that money started something else, took all that money, started Tesla, and now he got SpaceX, he got Twitter. You just keep going, keep going, keep, and he's the richest man in the world. But he, and so you find these entrepreneurs that just keep building companies over and over. I'm giving y'all the fast track. Um, but it's funny because they only take money from folks that look like them. So you never see African Americans invest or get invested in. Less than 1% of all uh, venture funds go to uh, minorities. So I ain't talking about African Americans, I'm talking about Latinx, African-Americans, females, the whole gamut, less than 1%. It's insane. And that's why you see these tech companies, when they're building up and they're hiring folks and they got their board seats, that's why we're not there because we've always been on the outside looking in. So as we talk to these companies or we talk to these VC firms, initially, everybody gave us the cold shoulder, like stick with your E-Trade. I heard that like 10 times, stick to E-Trade, stick to E-Trade, this ain't for you, this ain't for you. And uh, luckily enough, one dude let us in he was like, I'm going to open my portfolio to you, show you all the companies I invested in. And most of them tell us uh, consumer marketplaces, which are basically, you know, things athletes would know you're selling a product, you know, or, or things all of us would use. Like, we ain't talking about software SaaS where all the money's made, you just don't hear about it. And so um, what we tried to identify was how do we bring, bring value to a company outside of capital? Because they don't need our money. And that's why we never get in. It's just like, we got the money. We ain't got to take it. We can pick and choose who we take the money from. So it's like, all right, how do we differentiate ourselves to be valuable to this company? So the first company was called Twice. They eventually got bought out by eBay. But they were a secondhand clothing store. And now, now you've seen it with, um, uh, what's the, uh, it's been a Poshmark who sold off. Maybe pissed me off because I invested and made some money. Then they sold the company. Um, the Real Real is another one. Like secondhand clothing spots that you can, buy used clothing. And so they had all women, but they were trying to bring on the men's side. And so what I did was I had been to Fashion Week, known as a nice dresser, whatever you want to call it, my brand. What I did was took my brand and said, hey, let me help you launch your menswear line. It was like, we need to be able to, you're an athlete, you have a large following, people will see you, so this is very valuable to us. So I did this for free. Went in, did this, and uh, was the head of, I was the men's director of uh, fashion. So I put together looks, show men how to dress, be more involved in how you look, how you present yourself going to work. And this is before everybody started looking cool. Like we were still wearing baggy clothes back then. And so um, that turned into like learning how to differentiate myself and being valuable to a company. And so from there, it's just like, what's the next company? How can I do that? Next company, how can I do that? And so we got this formula down. So create value outside of the capital. Because they don't, really don't need our capital. Right. And so what you try to do is how do you use who you are and your brand? That's why your brand is so important. And so these people do their homework on you, too, which is insane. 
just like y'all get ready for the combine, they're talking to your high school coach, they're talking to your college coach, they're talking to your aunts, your uncles, they know everything about you. These companies are doing the same thing because these billion dollar companies, hopefully, they want to make sure that, you know, they got they, they T's crossed and their I's dotted. So um, that's, these are the things we need to start talking to each other about in terms of what is your brand. You know what I mean? Because when you get places, you know, most agencies, not this one, but most agencies you hear like, I'm gonna make you a superstar, I'm gonna turn your brand into this, I'm gonna turn your brand into that. But they don't really tell you, like, what's the essence of a brand? Like, is it really you? Like, what do you stand for? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? How can you influence other people? How can you influence the next generation to come from behind you and take care of the, the game of football? And like, you know, I think we take it for granted sometimes, I do too, but like there are real generations behind us that look up to us and emulate us. And you want to remember that as much as possible because like Alan Henderson was my teammate one time and Lou Williams was on my team at the same time, but they're like 20 years apart. And Lou Williams was like, bro, I remember I went to Atlanta Hawks game and I saw you kick a ball in the stands. I thought that was the coolest thing in my life. But like little stuff like that, he was like, yo, that is so embarrassing. Cause it's a stand up dude. But when you really think about it, who you are as your brand, like those moments matter. Like I walk in the airport and some dude was like, man, you shook my hand. One of y'all guys, one of, the, one of the guys was like, yo, you shook my hand in Philly when I was like 11 years old. I was like, damn. But like that stuff, that stuff matters. And when you build your brand up like that organically, like don't go out your way trying to be nice because you think it's going to get you an endorsement, but just be a good person. Things come back for you. For sure. Uh, so, I mean, just talking to the guys here, uh, a lot of guys are on the front end of their careers, you know, just getting into the league and kind of just starting to make a ton of money. In your eyes, what is the biggest mistake you see, you know, athletes make? Uh, and, you know, for these guys, uh, you know, what would you, you know, what piece of advice would you give them right now? I would say uh, read as much as possible. And it sounds so simple, but when you're, when you're well read, you can go anywhere in the world and maneuver in any space, even if you don't speak the language. It's like, that's probably the secret of life, just being well read. Like, read as much as possible. Like, I don't read as much as I would like because I'm keeping up with the stock market, keeping up in tech, but like, man, I don't care what you read, man, just read. And I say read because I have this thing I say about myself. I can solve everybody's problems but mine. Like, I can't, I can't figure out my own problems. But anytime somebody comes to a, with me to, with a problem, I figure it out. And that's because it, I've, I've read about it in some form or fashion. And you don't have to keep up with the Joneses either. Like, when you get a real perspective on, like, what you're trying to accomplish or, like, what your legacy really be, like I said, guys were coming to the league getting six cars. Like, that was a cool thing to do. But that's all they saw. But, you know, like I said, I, mean, I got made fun of in Denver by my teammates for reading. Like, you don't want to play Blu-ray? Nah, fam, I got work to do. Like, I'm going to read this book. Oh, you a nerd. Why, you always, why the fuck you always reading? She'd be like, yo, bro, y'all got to be the most ignorant people on earth to make fun of me for reading. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I didn't mind that. And sure enough, like, the majority of those guys on that team, because we had a great, talented team, they out the league in two or three years. And like, you start paying attention to things like that. Like, a guy on your team read. Think about it, you watch him read and a guy that's never gonna read a book. I mean, talent aside, you'll see he's gonna be in the league longer. It's night and day. It's night and day. And, and, it's, and, it's, and, and then you know who to build real relationships as well. And I always say this, because I don't want to forget to say this. Get as close to each other as possible. Because when you get out the league, there's no more taking care of everybody the same way. Your friends can't go on vacation every time with you. Uh, you know, all your family can't go on vacation with you all the time. And then nobody's going to be able to identify with the, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the psychological pain. But who? Guys that have been through it with you. And Aaron McKee always told me that. Like, when you get older and you're going on vacation, you go on golf trips, you go on with your teammates. And too many times I've seen guys not build those right relationships. And at age of 32, 33, 34, guys are going through midlife crisis. Guys are going to get divorced. Then guys are trying to spend all their money to get away from the trauma that they've been through or not being able to connect with people. So that's big for me. Like, you got to connect with each other, man. Like, I, I, I can't say that stress that part enough. Build with each other because then you're going to build those lifelong, lifelong relationships. 
and then you're going to need somebody to lean on. And, and like that, that's so big. And I think that's, you know, kind of segue. That's kind of the reason we do this here, right? We want to get all the guys together and, you know, the young guys that have any questions to the older guys and just, you know, developing those relationships uh, with their peers. You know what I mean? Like you just said, those are the people that are going to really understand what you're going through and what you've been through. Uh, you know, kind of talking about relationships, though, for you, you know, can you kind of talk about the importance of building relationships outside of just the sport itself, you know, in the business world, using that network, that platform that you get from being an athlete and how important that is? Yeah, so ask a lot of questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, I'll be honest, like I'll be in board meetings and they'll, be, they'll use like acronyms and I don't have a clue what they're talking about. I'll Google it. Like I'm not afraid to Google it. And I'll be like, all right, cool, I'm caught up. But then I'll write it down to make sure I remember it. But when I got into the league, there wasn't really a system set up where you can meet an exec or you can meet the CFO of the team or ask the owner, like, how'd you own the team? Like, how did you come to get here? Like, you never hear those. We, we never were able to create those relationships. But now I'm seeing more and more guys starting to build their network. And that's a part of reading, too. You know, I go do my homework on every owner in the NBA. All right, where he come from, how he, do, how he get his money. All right, it's the son that runs the team, so the dad had the money, where that come from? Just small things like that. And so now when you run into them, you can start a conversation. Like Cronkies, they own, they just won the championship with the Nuggets. They own the Rams. They own the Avalanche. They got Austin on soccer. Then they about to build a whole new complex in San Diego. Like I'm constantly reading about them. And so when I see the son, Josh Cronkie, I'm like, Yo, that was a nice deal y'all did in San Diego, man. Like, what sparked that idea? He's like, how you know about that? I'm like, I'll subscribe to this, I'll subscribe to this uh, newsletter that just keep me up to date on all the transactions in sports. He's like, oh shit, well we should talk about it. Well now we're about to get this golf team off the ground and we need some operators and they operate in like six different sports franchises. So now I'm like, yo, let's do this deal together. And now he's like, oh, all these conversations we had over the years, He's serious about business. Because all they want to know is if you're serious about it. They know you got the dedication. They know you got the talent. If you can read them playbooks y'all be reading, that shit be confusing me. Like basketball, it's all the same plays over and over again. You just meet somebody before they get there. But y'all y'all got complex, like y'all all geniuses. It's just like they tell us we, we entertainers and we athletes. That's a genius in itself. Like, man, y'all way smarter than y'all think y'all are. Because I didn't know it. It's like what they call it, imposter syndrome. I'll be in some of them boardrooms, like, do I even belong here? Like, thinking. But once I'm around them for a long time, I'm like, man, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> like, you just, you It's just, all about where you put your focus, right? For exactly. You guys, we say that all the time. Like, as a football player, for you to be able to not only understand the playbook and what's going on, but then be able to go out there and, you know, understand and, and, and uh, execute these plays amongst the chaos that's around you is crazy. You know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, for you, if you put your time and your effort into understanding the marketplace, right, mm -hmm. or tech or whatever it is you want to, it's just about what's important to you and what you spend your time on. You know yeah, I mean? and I will say, like, it's not easy. Like, well, football's my, not easy, right? Basketball's right, not easy. Right. It's about how much, you know, how much you effort you want to put into it. You got to put the same effort energy into it. Like, you, I know y'all, like, y'all the best athletes in the world. We are the <clears> best athletes in the world, and that's what we do. But don't let that take away all the other stuff you can do, but it's supposed to be hard. Like I always tell guys like, yo, when you get to the Super Bowl, you get to the finals, if it ain't hard, you're not gonna win. You gotta feel like you gotta give you everything, but it's the same thing on the other side. And you got it in you, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta get it out of yourself and don't be afraid to fail. Cause it's not really failing if you're trying as hard as you can, but just put yourself out there, be vulnerable. But like my wife be on my ass cause like I'm on all the time. Like, I've been on the West Coast twice this week. Now I'm here this morning, out tomorrow. Then I got to go back to Vegas next week, go back to the family, then go back again, like, constantly on. But I do have, like, this grand vision and this goal in terms of, like, regentrifying my community. You know what I'm saying? Building real endowments where you just take in the interest and that's how you support, as opposed to just putting a Band-Aid over a bullet wound. Like, look up the, the top endowments in America. It's Harvard, Stanford, Yale. It's predominantly white institutions, and it's been set up like that from the beginning. So when you start learning these systems, that's, what the, that's the, all reading. It's all reading, and the more we read, the more knowledge we gain, the more we can come together and figure out how the system works, because it really don't have to be the way it is in terms of the communities we come from. It's, it's, it's kind of sad, but at the same time, it gives you hope because we the ones that are supposed to fix the next generation, if you really think about it, and that's to give y'all all, you know, 
the energy and the excitement to, man, let me go dive into this thing and, and do my part in it. For sure. So now you own a tech fund, obviously with Rudy, you guys own Mastery. Mm -hmm. uh, you own you know, sports teams. I know you guys are just invested in, in, a, in a soccer team across, mm -hmm. in, uh, across the pond. Uh, you guys obviously own A1. You know, for you, what's next? Like, what are you looking at next? Like, what, you know, on your plate, like, I did this, this, and this. This is what I'm focused on. This is what's important to me now. Yeah, it, it doesn't stop, actually. Um, like, Rudy and I were on a call this morning. Um, I don't know if y'all saw Tiger Woods and Maury McElroy. Uh, they started an indoor golf league, right? And I'm big into golf. And um, I got an opportunity to invest in the league, like, early, early on, when it was, it was just a concept. And now I saw it. Uh, Alex Ohenny, I forgot how to say his last name, Serena's, Serena's husband that started Reddit. They were the first ones to get a team. So now they got a team in LA. Now Fenway Sports Group, who LeBron's with, they got, the, they got a couple teams. They got a hockey team. Uh, they got the Red Sox. Uh, they got a soccer team as well over to overseas. Like they, they killing it. Um, they're about to roll out the next team. You know, all the work I've been doing, excitement I had in golf, I got the opportunity to get a golf team now and then actually going through the process of putting the team together. Like, I'm super excited about it. Like, I've been trying to, he's been getting on my ass about playing too much golf, but I've been telling him, <laughs> I've been telling him like, man, I'm telling you this gonna thing, it's gonna pay off. I didn't know it was gonna pay off like this, but you know, just being at the right place at the right time, paying attention to everything that's going on, always keeping my ear to the ground. Like every morning, like I have this process. I read Stratechery, uh, then I read this, um, this other news letter that gives me all my tech news. Uh, obviously, the Wall Street Journal I su subscribe to. Um, I only watch two channels in my house. I watch Bloomberg and Golf Channel. Y'all should watch Bloomberg. This shit is like a uh, foreign language for like s eight months. It's a foreign language. Like, I'm like, I don't know what they saying. Like, I got my phone trying to figure out. But I told my brother the same thing, and this was like a proud moment. My older brother, who's a finance major, got a degree. I'm like, watch Bloomberg. He called me back like two weeks later, like, bro, I don't understand what they're saying. And he a finance major. I'm like, bro, just give it like a couple months. He called me like four months ago and was like, bro, this is the coldest shit I've ever seen. Like, I understand everything they're saying. And he was like, I don't watch nothing else. Because now you're seeing what's happening in the world before other people watch what's happening. You know, they say it's three types of people. You either uh, don't know what's happening, or you're watching what's happening, or you're making shit happen. And when you know what's happening before everybody else, that's when you can make shit happen. Because that's all they're doing is betting on the future. They betting on stuff that's gonna come out in four or five years and they getting all the growth. And then now we like, oh, this is hot company. Once everybody know about it, it's too late. That's what happened in the crypto space. You had a million crypto millionaires because they were just on it earlier than we were. So it's all about, that's that reading part, same thing. Like just, just stay in tap with what's coming and, and you're gonna figure shit out. I think a big part of what you said that I, you know, that I kind of connect with is a lot of times you know, I see this as like when you tell guys, and you know, I'm guilty of it myself, right? Go here, go there. You're not getting paid for it, right? It's mm -hmm. go there, network, right? Mm -hmm. Big part of that is you never know who you might meet there. This might be the guy that's starting the next, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you want, you know, the Cash App yep. or, or Venmo or whatever it is, yep. right? And he gives you the opportunity to invest alongside him because he's met you. You know, he, he likes the fact that you're so interested in stuff outside of the sport. So it's not all about, OK, what can I make from this financially today? It's about setting yourself up with relationships that a lot of times these relationships cost, you know, uh, allow you to gain way more than just money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, that access is super important. Right. Um, so I, I think we've kept you guys long enough. But if you had to leave the guys with one thing, what, you know, what would it be? You know, uh, do internships. Do internships and do like table talks. That was one thing that we did like early on. I didn't understand the table talks. But I just go in and just was like, I'm cool. Um, like I'll do it, not knowing what would come from it. Can you explain what a table talk is? And so I would, after we won a cha championship, like that kind of changed everything. Like people start calling us. The people that said no, they start calling. And so I learned how to flip the script on winning the championship. You win the championship NBA and you play a major role, like you can basically walk in any company you want and give a speech on championship culture. And it's, it's like, they love, they eat that shit up. Like we all champions, we made it to the league for real, for real, it ain't no different. Like you make it to the league, you're a champion. And, and they blind us with their ring. But that's another story. But I would go to like, uh, I went to Yelp. Uh, I went to Zoom. I went to uh, Box, which is a, uh, a cloud company. Uh, Logitech. We went to so many companies just giving, like, uh, like me, you and I talking. And we just talked about championship culture. And the employees ate that shit up. Because what I didn't know is all other companies had the same problems our teams got. You got the star players who got ego. The receivers got all the egos. Chad Ocho, single crazy ass. 
and you know you got guys that do all the brunt of the work, the linemen that don't get no credit. It's the same thing in these tech companies that I didn't know because these are the smartest people in the world, but they all got egos. So the CEO is telling me like, you don't understand we got the same issue. And you being a sixth man, you sacrificing for the better of the team, I need you to tell them that. And at first I'm like, huh, you, you're dealing with the smartest people in the world. And then I had to remind myself, we the smartest people in the world too. We making decisions in split seconds. Normal people can't do that. And so I was giving these speeches and from there I start working those relationships. Now they let me invest in the company. You know what I mean? It's because you built the, you put the groundwork in building a relationship. Right, and I'm doing all that for free. Like, yeah. I'm not charging them. And the internships were so good because I got, like, firsthand experience if I was built out for it. And I was playing basketball at the same time. So I work for Comcast Ventures, um, which is, like, a, I forgot what they call It's like a subsidiary of Comcast, the cable company. And uh, they have to keep from being disrupted by the Netflix of the world or anybody else trying to disrupt them, they got to invest in companies to see what's coming next, too. And so that's why you see a lot of Apple buying out this company, you know, Google buying out that company. They buying out companies that's going to wipe them clean out. Buying so a competitor smart, out, yeah. Right? And so when I work for Comcast Ventures, I'm learning, okay, this is why y'all would have a fun. This is why y'all would invest in companies because y'all just rolling them up into y'all company. That's how y'all keep growing. And I learned, like, how to gain respect from my peers because they're looking at me like, oh, he's just a basketball player. And before you know it, all of them calling me to take calls with them. Like, can you get on this call with me? Can you get on this call with me? I'm like, why y'all always keep calling me to get on the calls? I got more access than they got. I just had no idea. And so when I jump on the call, they winning those deals because I'm on the call. And that's when I figured out like, okay, I found my value in being present, but now I'm gonna find my value because I'm gonna learn the business the same way they do. They just went to school for it for eight years. And so now it all for me is to make up for time. I got to keep studying and learn the business. So don't be afraid to take internships. And uh, do those company talks, man. They work. They really work. For sure. Open it up for questions. You guys have any questions that y'all want to ask? Any, anything that, uh, you know, Andre can answer? Bach? Three best books you've ever read. Ooh. Ooh. No audio books, man. No audio no books. No audio. Audio books are good. <laughs> That's all I do is audio. <laughs> A good audio book I did was, um, um, Sapiens was cold. Mm -hmm. You want me to say Seed of the Soul? Adrian and I have been talking. Seed of the Soul was one of my favorite books. Um, Celestine Prophecy was really good. I can go on and on and on and on. I got like a library in my house. My, my wife is, uh, she got like a purpose going to SAT. So like she just be handing me books. Um, Snowball Effect on Warren Buffett was really good because he didn't approve the book. He tried to get it cut at the last minute because it was revealing too much. But I learned a lot about Warren Buffett in this book. Essentially, Warren Buffett was like, he's like an athlete, right? So we've been playing, we've been playing our sport since we were like five, four or five years old, right? I'm in Texas. Y'all had kindergartens out there playing. Like, they serious about their sport. Like, they don't play with Brown with football in Texas. Warren Buffett's uncle was uh, like the head of the stock market. So when Warren was like cheat code, seven years old, he was memorizing stocks. And then he would collect like golf balls at the golf range that went in the water and reselling them back to the golf course. And he had this, um, he had this thing for collecting coins. And that turned into collecting stamps. And it turned into collecting money. He just obsessed with collecting money. He ain't doing really, he just obsessed with the shit. So just like we like throwing touchdowns, catching touchdowns, sacking the quarterback interceptions, he just like collecting money. So he got a knack for like seeing like, Oh, that company's undervalued, that company's overvalued. And he had been doing it since he was eight years old. If he ain't the, if he ain't the richest person in the world and he failed, he just did some shit he was like doing. And he just, be, he, that's why he don't spend the money. Y'all be like, why Warren Buffett don't spend the money? He not doing it for the money. He just obsessed with collecting money. And when I thought, I was like, holy shit, this, he just shot a basketball 10,000 times. It's the same thing. All right, now everybody else is gonna name their three favorite books. All right, we're gonna start. No, <laughs> <laughs> he looked up quick like shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, any any anybody else? <laughs> any any other any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, Will Smith's book is good. Yeah, it is. I, I, I learned why he did what he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Couldn't protect his mom. Yeah, I read it. I read it. That book's good, it. man. Audio book. No, that book is good. Oh, yeah, the audio, audio the audio book. better because it's in his, his voice. voice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's better effects.
Okay. Yeah, Will Smith's book is good. Any other questions out here? Great question, great question. And I meant to say this earlier too. Well, I, real quick, can you repeat your, you didn't say it loud. Can, yeah, you? can you uh, walk through your investment thesis and how you analyze companies that you invest in? Mm-hmm. So I, I will say this, and I learned this from Jeff Jordan who let us in. He's like the, uh, he's like the godfather of marketplaces. Um, he works for Andreessen Horowitz. He's an investor in mastery, genius dude. And uh, this is for y'all. He said, if a company is begging you for your money, don't invest with them. Because if it's a good company, nine times out of 10, they turn the people down. So if the company turning down your money, just keep hitting them up over and over, them the ones. But in terms of investment thesis, the first thing is the market size. And so people short side themselves in terms of like, I wanna do this or I wanna do this. Like my wife one time was like, why don't they have a company that uh, when you go rent a house for 30 days or more, they get you towels and sheets and different things like that. Like how, why, why haven't anyone think about, thought about this yet? And I'm thinking to myself like, well, there's not enough people in the world with enough money to rent a house for 30 days in the first damn place on Venetian Island, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't even know what I said, so. Exactly, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the market size isn't big enough. Mm -hmm. Like how many people are you really going to serve? It's niche, yeah. This is too small of a market. Now, you can have a niche market, a niche market if you know how to scale it. So most companies start out with something really small. And if you see the vision or there's a good CEO, they'll explain it eBay started what? Selling Beanie Babies. That's all they moved. But they knew over time they would add more things. Amazon is the best example. Books, yeah. He knew, all right, I'm gonna start this company and we gonna sell books online. And he was like, this is the, the, the everything store. Read that book. It's long though, so you can audio book that too. The everything store is really good. And so he's like, I'm only selling books. They're like, you're only selling books. Why would you invest in that? Selling books? He was like, he had his whole thesis, eventually we're gonna become the everything store. He was saying this when he was selling books, but nobody got it, except the certain folks. And now we see what happened with Amazon. Now he's one of the richest people in the world. So you start out with market size, um, and then you go with uh, competition. So you have what you call aggregators. And like the aggregators are folks who can, pretty much, you gotta go through them to get whatever it is that they sell. That's what an aggregator is. Like they control the whole ecosystem. Like you, you can't move around them. Even if you buy something from somebody else, you still gotta go through Amazon. And that's where the FTC uh, comes involved and the, uh, the other big government company. When you get too big, you become a monopoly. Aggregators are like close to monopolies. And so I see a lot of companies get started and they pitch me. And I look at it and say, well, Facebook is gonna copy that because they almost wiped Snapchat out. So the social media movement is dead because Facebook's buying all that up. And then search engines, Google buying all them companies up, they just gonna wipe you out. And so now I'm looking at like, can you be defensible? They call it a moat. This is a, a Warren Buffett uh, tag he came up with. Can you build a moat? Basically a moat is you got this big piece of land and there's an island all around you. And there's a bridge from the island to the nearest piece of land, but the only way to get through the bridge is they open the door for you. If you can build a moat, you can be defensible to any other company attacking you, a big company, then you wanted something. So it's mainly those two things. There's a lot more nuances that go into it. Most of the time, it's the third one. You're not invested in the company. In You're invested in the person. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did a bunch of podcasts, and it was Google guys were really hard to get funding. Nobody really liked the Google guys because they said they were a little quirky, they were weird, or whatever the issue was with the Google guys, people didn't like how they came off. And obviously the people that bet on them, it went crazy, but they, it was hard for them to find funding at first because yes, you really are investing in a person. So, you know, what's their temperament like? You know, um, can they really scale a company? And uh, Rudy and I talk about this all the time. There's different types of CEOs. There's a, a CEO when you got 500 companies, 500 employees, there's a CEO when you have a thousand employees, there's a CEO when you have 10,000 employees. If you can identify like this special people that can go from the beginning to the end of CEO, if you can identify them, that's when you get those serial entrepreneurs. And it's funny because when you identify them, they'll start a company and build it up to a billion dollars and then they got all their money, but then they get bored two years later, they start another company, do it again. Two years later, do it again. We just, I just ran into the cat from, uh, we were at a conference this week in Santa Barbara. Cat that started Instagram. 
he sold for what three billion, two billion to, to uh, Facebook. And they said he got did dirty. He said he should have took like fifteen. Now he bored. You know he ain't got nothing to do. He got the spotlight. He got he a billionaire. He started another company. But we built that relationship back then. Even when I couldn't invest, I think Rudy knew like man he gonna start something else. We still got to keep that relationship. Fast forward to today, he started another company. It's like an AI. It's like an AI, some AI company. He's doing that. So yeah, those three things: marketplace, market size, um, the person you invest in, and can they build a moat? Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Good question. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any other questions? All right. Well, can we give a hand? To the Thanks, fella. Appreciate you coming out. Yes, thank you. Time yep. man. Appreciate yes, you. Yes, sir. For I sure. hope y'all got something out of this, man. I, I really, I really do. Definitely, yep. man. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys coming out.